Great, thank you. Okay, so my name is Andrew Piper, and uh, Jamie and I are going to be talking about methods for estimating healthy life expectancy. So, is that? Uh, so just to introduce ourselves briefly, so we're from LCP Health Analytics, part of a broader consultancy and technology firm, uh, a relatively new department, and um, we've got our five service areas listed on the right. Jamie and I are in the, the HEAL team, so health economics focused. Um, so, uh, so first introduce HLE. Um, so what is healthy life expectancy, or HLE? So put simply, it's the it's an estimate of the number of years of good health that a person will spend over their lifetime. So similar to qualies, um, it incorporates both the mortality and the morbidity of a population in one measure. What are its applications? Um, so it's widely used as a measure of inequality. It's published regularly by the INS. And in 2022, the UK government incorporated it into its levelling up mission. So it set two goals for HLE, one of which was to increase it by five years by 2035, and then the second goal was to reduce the inequality gap between the most deprived and the least deprived areas. Um, as well as being a measure of uh, general health, you can also apply it to specific disease areas. So you can look at the um, number of years spent free of a certain disease, as well as the number of years spent in general good health. Um, in terms of how it's calculated, so Jamie and I are going to be talking about two of the most common methods. So that these are the Sullivan method and multi-state models. And we'll also talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each one and when we might look, look to use each method. And finally, why, why use R? Um, so some of the methods, the Sullivan method in particular, can be implemented in Excel. Um, but uh, as with a lot of uh, computationally heavy processes, um, if you're looking to do repeated calculations, R can be useful for automating things. And also for multi-state models, Jamie's going to talk about certain R packages that can be used to implement that. So I'm going to start by talking about the Sullivan method. So the Sullivan method is the simplest and most widely used method for estimating HLE. And its data requirements are fairly, fairly simple. Um, so you need mortality rates and health prevalence rates. So that's the proportion of people in good health at a certain age. Um, so that's cross-sectional data, just at a point of time for a given population. And the calculations can be Im implemented in Excel. There's an ONS template available. Um, but if you're, as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking to repeat calculations, R can be very useful for automation. Uh, I've got a chart here which illustrates uh, life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. So this is looking at the survival of a population over time. And if we look at overall survival, so that would be the, uh, the blue and the red area, uh, that's going to give us the life expectancy. If we want to look at just healthy life expectancy, that's just the time spent in good health. Um, that's the blue area. So I'm going to talk through some code for using the Sullivan method. So this is a, a fairly simple function. Um, the inputs it takes, as I mentioned, are the mortality rates and the health prevalence rates. Um, and we also need to specify the ages that we're going to calculate it for. So it's worth choosing a sensible limiting age, i.e. the oldest age that we're going to model outputs for, um, the oldest age that you assume people are going to live to, typically that would be 100, 110, or 120. And then the idea is that the, the function we're able to output life expectancy and healthy life expectancy at each of those ages. Um, the kind of first half of the, the function here is some standard uh, actuarial life table calculations. So essentially you're setting up a cohort of lives and tracking them over time as they age. The second part of the function is the healthy life expectancy part of it. So the way that this is set up is you take your cohort of lives, you multiply it by your health prevalence data. So we've got that first highlighted line there, which um, effectively creates a second cohort of just healthy lives, so, so people in good health, and then we effectively track those in a separate life table over time. Uh, the line below that, TX healthy, then sums up all of those expected life years spent in good health uh, for the population, and then if we divide that through by the number of lives at, at, at the starting age, so LX, the line below, we get the healthy life expectancy. So I've got a slight illustration of how that works in the table down here. Um, so the orange column on the left is tracking the overall number of lives. We then take the proportion of those that are in good health, the health prevalence rate, so 80%, for example, and then convert that to an estimated number of healthy lives. We sum up 
over all future years to get future years of good health, and then we divide through by the size of the population to get healthy life expectancy. And then we can output that at each year of age. And I just got an illustration here of one of the applications. So see that that function itself is is, is relatively simple, something that could be done in Excel. But if we're looking to um, we're looking to automate it and run multiple calculations, uh, then we can effectively loop through the function. So what we've done here is we've applied the Sullivan function described before to ONS data on mortality and health prevalence uh, across various local areas. Uh, and I've got a couple of charts at the bottom here just illustrating some results. So we've compared healthy life expectancy by age across a few, few cities in Yorkshire. And then on the right-hand side, we've looked at the correlation between female healthy, healthy life expectancy and population density. So seeing that areas with slightly lower population density, perhaps more rural areas, have generally slightly higher healthy life expectancy. Um, and I guess important to highlight the third point. So although the ONS does publish healthy life expectancy, I guess where the code could really be useful is if we're looking to model the effect of interventions. So let's say we wanted to model the effect of perhaps a smoking cessation program um, or the effect of a new drug in terms of what it's going to do to healthy life expectancy. We could tweak the underlying mortality and health prevalence rates, effectively shift those curves in that left-hand chart to model the effect of the intervention. So that's the Sullivan method. And I'm going to hand over to Jamie now to talk about multi-state models. Thank you. So I'm now going to give a quick overview of perhaps some more familiar methods in the health economic world uh, using multi-state models to model healthy life expectancy. So brief overview, some of which likely to be quite familiar from Markov multi-state models uh, used in health economics. Um, multi-state models can be used to model any system characterized by a discrete set of states. So for healthy life expectancy, we can use a simple example of a three-state model, including a healthy state, an ill health state, and a death state. Of course, for specific disease areas, you can add in other states to incorporate phases of disease progression. Uh, but for the simple example, we'll just use the three-state model. Recoveries or backwards transitions uh, between health states can also be included in these models to allow for improvement in health. But again, just for illustrative purposes and conceptual purposes on the next slide, we just consider the forward transitions here. The transition rates can be estimated generally in one of two ways either using longitudinal data in regression-based models, or they can be set based on expert opinion in non-regression-based models. Um, being our focus, this is going to use, there's lots of packages for multi-state modeling in R, but this focuses on the MSM package, um, which is obviously a regression-based model. There are several assumptions required for MSM. First, of course, the Markov property. Uh, Semi-Markov models can be considered in other packages, but the package we use for estimating healthy life expectancy is dependent on the output of the MSM package. The second assumption is that baseline hazards have a parametric form, so this means they can be modelled or captured by some sort of mathematical formula. And then the third thing is that MSM works for continuous time Markov models. So once we have our multi-state models set up, we can then calculate healthy life expectancy as the expected time spent in the healthy state. And in the conceptual uh, problem where we're not considering recoveries, then this is simply the area under the survival curve for the healthy state. Of course, when those backwards transitions are included, we're then looking at areas between the curves. These life expectancies can be calculated at R using the ELECT package on the MSM output. This package is essentially performing numerical integration to estimate those areas under the curves. One of the key assumptions for the ELECT package is that the baseline hazards defining each transition increase exponentially with age. So that in other words, they're gone distributed. And we also need to specify a baseline state di distribution as an input into the ELECT package. So I'm now going to walk through some simple code for implementing this in R. So first, the data input, as I mentioned, this requires a longitudinal data set that has a single row for each observation as an individual. So as you can see in the table on the right or left of that screen, um, there's an ID column to give the identifier for the individual, and then each row contains the age and state that individual was in at each observation. There's a fourth column that contains the indicator for whether this is a baseline state or not. In order to run the MSM package, we first um, specify the Q matrix, 
which defines the allowable transitions between states. So in this case, there's between states 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 1 to 3. And once this matrix has been defined, we then call the MSM function and specify the dependence of the health state on first age and then any covariates that we want to include in the model. Some other useful arguments for the MSM function include OBS type, which is used to specify whether tr the transition times between states are known exactly. And in more complex models, it can be also used to specify whether the state immediately before transition is known. A second and linked concept is death exact, which can be used to specify whether the entry time into the absorbing state, which in the healthy life expectancy model is the death state, is exactly known. Once the MSM package has been used to fit the multi-state model, we can then use the elect package on the output in order to calculate the state-specific life expectancies. So first, as I mentioned, we specify the baseline state distribution, and that's given by the indicator column that was in our original data set. And then we call the elect function, which runs on the MSM output. It's important in the covariates that, again, the first covariate should be age to specify the age dependency of the hazards. And then other inputs into the function include the maximum allowed age, like we had in the Sullivan method, which defines the maximum age that we consider, which is up to age 120 in this example. We can also specify the number of iterations, S, if we're interested in quantifying uncertainty in the estimations. We've also got the grid size in H, and also the time scale, which can vary generally as in years, but it could be months or weeks if we wanted to specify that. Once we run this function, we then get an output that provides a point and mean and standard error estimates for each of the state-specific life expectancies. For the healthy life expectancy, the healthy state was state 1, so E11 is providing an estimate of the healthy life expectancy, and we also get an estimate at the bottom for the total life expectancy given by E. So that's a very quick overview of multi-state modelling for healthy life, ex uh, life expectancy, and I'll hand back to Andrew to summarise. Great, thanks Jamie. So just to recap on what we've discussed, so we've got these two methods for estimating healthy life expectancy. Uh, the Sullivan method is the slightly simpler one, uh, it incorporates health prevalence rates into standard life table calculations. It's generally a fairly calculation-like method, um, which just relies on cross-sectional data that can be scaled up for multiple calculations quite easily. Um, and that's, that's yeah, often where R comes in and can certainly help with that. Um, on the other hand, multi-state models, uh, which have the advantage that they can project individual patient health trajectories, and they can also allow for multiple health states. So Jamie spoke about the healthy ill-dead model. You could potentially have multiple states of, of, of sickness, or if you're looking at a particular disease, um, multi-state models tend to be quite flexible in terms of what you can use them for. Um, however, if you're using regression-based multi-state models, the data requirements are often more complex. complex. You often need longitudinal data um, to fit to. So that, that can be a, a disadvantage of using multi-state models. Um, and as Jamie discussed, there are specific R packages like MSM and ELECT which can be used to fit multi-state models and produce HLE estimates. Uh, the final point that I want to um, discuss is uh, an idea of whether there might be scope in the future for using HLE in HDAs. So as I'm sure you're all aware, NICE primarily uses qualies at the moment to measure the benefits of healthcare technologies. Um, so HLE is uh, an analogous composite measure, takes into account both longevity and health status, um, and it can also be applied to specific disease areas. So I worked on a project recently which looked at the time spent free of uh, CBD events, for example. And um, an advantage of HLE is that in certain situations it might be easier to gather binary health state data, so just whether someone's in good health or not, than the granular quality of life data required for estimating qualities. Uh, further point to note is that HLE and qualities can be mapped to each other. So if you assign quality of life scores to the healthy state and the, the, the unhealthy state, 0.9 and 0.5 or whatever, um, then you can generate a, a quality estimate and, and vice versa. You can, you can um, switch between the two. Um, in terms of sort of another broader uh, value point on HLE, um, link it back to the point about the government targets earlier, um, analysing the impact of interventions at a local and national level can provide... Um, uh, sort of intuitive understanding of, of, of interventions contribution towards the government HLE targets as a kind of broader uh, perspective as well. So that's uh, all in terms of content and um, yeah, open it up for any questions.
Alex has the chat, sorry. I can ask a question if you're good on that. Sure. Um, yeah, so this is thanks for your talk, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, my question would be around kind of the, the MSM component. So um, I suppose it's just whenever you're using the like the Q matrix, how did you define those initial parameters or did you like did you make it different initial starting values or kind of um, <coughs> Like how many convergence issues or things like that, or like what was the process in terms of getting that kind of yes, so there? Because I know it can be quite tricky. It can be it can be quite tricky. That was very much a trial and error. Op optimize it, try different values, and see how the convergence looked uh, towards the end of it. So yeah, it was very much a process of yeah. trying out the values, seeing how it looked, and sort of testing uh, increments either yeah. side to, to optimize the process. I think there's a there's a process if you kind of take like random initial startings or I think it's like yeah. in it or something and do it that way but also changing the is it the DFGS is like the um the, like the standard optimization approach that they use and like changing all of those so it'd be really interesting to see because in HTAs like you might get the output of something but actually to see how that sensitive analysis of everything mm -hmm. would follow on if it does you know lead to kind of HTAs and things like that so really yeah interesting to think about that of course yeah definitely uh, yeah, do you want to answer the questions? Great, yeah, so we've got a question in the chat. So it says, for nice, key is that qualities are based on preference-based measure of, HR, of, of uh, QOL, what about HLE? Um, so the method itself just relies on binary health data, so it's, it's, it's fairly flexible. Um, the way that ONS defines HLE is in terms of use, using survey data on good health. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess a, a drawback is we'd lose some of the granularity um, of, 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 of using uh, preference-based quality of life data but um, yeah as I mentioned there's this kind of it, there's, there's yeah possibility of sort of interchanging between the, the two mapping between the two um, and yeah I guess th there are some situations where the, the kind of simpler binary data might be more readily available than so does ONS have guidance on what constitutes good health so if someone has got moderate asthma that's well controlled over their life that's probably good health but if they have something very serious. So what, what kind of flips the switch on that classification? Yeah, I haven't looked into this survey question in all its detail, but I know it's got a few different gradings. It's got, I think, very good, good, fair, poor, and very poor. Um, and I think there are some descriptions that, that link to all of those, and it would be kind of the very good and the good states sure. would contribute. So I think presumably in that good state, there'll be some people who have maybe you know, mild asthma or some, some, some conditions that sure. may know not, you know, perhaps not in perfect health, but still would judge themselves to be in good health. Uh, so I'm not, not too familiar with the government's yeah. own own processes. Uh, clearly, they've got these these fairly ambitious targets. Um, we we've done some modelling looking at the effect of smoking interventions. Um, so the government target is to improve HLE by five years by 2035. Uh, we we tried to work out how much of a dent sort of it, it, some quite radical smoking interventions could could make in that, and we found that it's basically not going to get anywhere close to five years. So sort of the conclusion of that is it's probably going to need quite a few different interventions if they're hoping to meet the target, or the other way of looking at it is maybe the target is sort of intentionally ambitious and then <laughs> sort of any progress towards that is, is beneficial. But I, yeah, I'm not too familiar with the exact kind of internal processes that, that the government uses. Okay. Yeah. One last question, Howard. Um, just on MSM, there are a few technical things. Um, you said that you could get a parametric model to the baseline hazards, but it's much more restrictive than that. It's a constant hazard, mm -hmm. so basically just an exponential the only reason you can pick a bumper is that you have a dependence on age. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So my, because these restrictions are all there because MSM was designed for interval sensored data. Yeah. Do you have interval sensored data or do you have exact data? Because if you have exact data, you shouldn't be using MSM. You could be using Flexer or something. Yeah, of course. Well, the, 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 the uh, issue with the life expectancy calculation is that the elect package has been designed to work on that output from the MSM. So it sort of takes the output from the MSM into the elect package to, in order to calculate the life expectancies and it is intended to be used on the interval sensor data which is obviously the benefit uh, of, of using that method. Great, thank you. If there's no more questions, we'll, we'll thank uh, both of you and we'll have lunch, I think. Thank you.